<clears throat> Hello, everybody. This is Patrick Halliday from the Agency of Education. I'm the director of the Education Quality Division here, and uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us for our first of these uh, what we're calling coffee and conversations, although I'm not exactly sure what virtual coffee sounds like, but virtual conversations are, or should they taste like. Uh, virtual conversations, though, will be uh, hopefully a little bit more uh, clear cut. Um, I, mean, I just want to go over a couple of ground rules before I kind of turn it over to to you to ask your questions and, and let this have a chance to, uh, to ask questions and follow ups and all of that. Um, first, I just want to introduce, um, let me see here. Some of the folks who are in the room with me and some of the folks joining us virtually. Um, we have uh, actually, we have Josh Sillier, who's the Assistant Director of the Ed Quality Division, Jesse Roy, who's the Assistant uh, Director of the Federal Programs Team. We also have Mariana C. <laughs> I'm not going to try to say her last name, and Kevin Doring, who are Ed Quality Coordinators, and Ali, uh, Amy Scalabrini. Um, uh, who's on the on the division as well, joining us to to kind of help answer questions. I also want to give uh, recognize we have uh, Evangeline Ambat um, and David Blumenthal, who have been our uh, some of our national partners with this. Um, a thirty second history. Back in November, we had Evangeline and David coming up to Vermont, um, and a ice storm hit, and these series of conversations are kind of are the outgrowth of that trying to figure out how we can still deliver some of that content that they uh, were going to, to work with us to do, um, but do it in a, um, a little bit more structured um, manner. So they will be chiming in uh, on occasion to, to share their input as well. Um, a couple of just, uh, we're using GoToWebinar. Um, I, uh, hopefully folks can see the screen here that's, um, as I'm going through the slideshow. Um, a couple of different ways to let us know when you have a question. Uh, we have some questions that were submitted previously, and we're going to kick off that, uh, kick off with that. Um, but there is a, a question tab in your toolbox or tool. Uh, what am I trying to say? Your, your drop-down box to menu um, that you can type in your questions, and we'll be monitoring those. Um, everyone is currently on mute right now. Um, if you want to be unmuted, if you have a question to ask, there is a, a hand raising ability and we will do our best to notice when your hand is raised, we'll unmute individual folks uh, to ask their question. Again, you can type it in uh, if you would prefer to do that and we can read it out this way. We also have a chat tab uh, that's um, on that same menu bar um, that you can be adding anything that's in right now. Um, we have a whole bunch of slides. We're not really going to go through all of the slides other than um, uh, at just some really high level. The slides are really there for us to refer to, to try to, uh, to focus um, or to, to give some context. Um, a real quick overview. If we think about um, kind of where we are and where we're going, um, today, session one, we're going to be looking as part of kind of the, the, the CNA process, the Comprehensive Needs Assessment and CIP and CFP process, all of those together. We're going to be focusing largely on this idea of collaborative inquiry um, and the broad areas of focus data and uh, in, uh, in your data inventory. We may start to wander a little bit into identifying priority, uh, priority problems of practice. But our session two for, which is, um, the, I forget the date off the top of my head, we have a slide at the end. Uh, we'll come back and, and really focus more directly on the priorities of practice and root cause analysis. And the final one uh, session, um, we'll be looking at um, writing SMART goals and developing a working theory of improvement. So with that uh, being said, um, I'm just going to start us off here with a question that I'm going to throw to our table, and then we will uh, move forward from there. Uh, this was one that was submitted previously, and it says, uh, is it necessary to submit data on the ed quality standards or only the ones pertinent to our CIP? And this is, I think, in reference to the data inventory that we shared out a couple weeks ago. Do you need to have uh, data um, on all of the different um, we'll call them all the different rows in that data inventory, um, or is this limited um, only to the ones that are pertinent to our CIP? And I'll throw that to Josh first, and Jesse, I think you probably have a few things to add there as well. Well, I think as far as the, the CIP and your CFP applications go, um, we do not need 
I mean, the, the question asked specifically what data. We do not need the specific data. What we would like to see are those sources of data and some summarized findings. And as far as the continuous improvement plan goes, I only going to be looking at sections pertinent to your continuous improvement plan goals. So if you have goals around ELA and safe, healthy schools, those are the two sections of the data inventory. I will be looking for uh, sources of data and um, and again, those summarized findings. So sources of data that are relevant to your continuous improvement plan goals. goals. Jesse, you have a little bit different take for your needs for continuous improvement or for uh, CFP. Yep. So for the second part of the data inventory, you know, the part designed specifically to inform and support CFP application investments, it's going to be kind of a similar answer. You know, if you seek to invest in, let's say, activities um, that would be allowable under Title II, you're going to want to complete that that section of of the data inventory with enough um, enough data in a comprehensive enough way to support the sorts of things you want to invest in. You know, when you write those statements of purpose for those investments, my team should be able to look back at your data inventory and see kind of a clear A to B connection between what you've given as data informed findings and then what you're going to invest in in your CFP application. So a similar answer. If you're not planning to invest your funds in a certain area, then don't include data about that certain area. But if you if you are going to write strategies, you know, to support a certain need, that should be made clear in your data inventory under that funding source. Jesse, can I ask a follow up on that? Is is this a is the data inventory or, or <clears throat> um, considered a one time submission? So if I don't think I want to have a math investment, but later on I realize I do, is this something that I can go back? edit or uh, revise and resubmit it, or are you just asking for this to be sent in once? No, I think that's a great question. I think, you know, there is a high a high probability this year that folks will receive feedback from the CFP team, you know, along the lines of, hey, you know, we read this investment, it's allowable under Title II. However, your local needs don't really bear out allowing us to, to approve spending on this activity. If you have data to support it, if there's a need that you've uncovered through your data analyses, then go back and, and update your data inventory, upload it again with your updates, you know, and, and then it may very well support that CFP investment. So now this is this is a living document, Patrick, and I think it's a great question. Um, you know, and I think one of the impetuses for making it an upload versus, you know, something sort of existed in a more rigid way in the GMS system was to allow you to update it sort of as needed in response to either feedback from the CFP team about an investment not being adequately supported or if during the course of your year, you identify that, hey, we've got this data supporting this new need. I need to write, say, a new Title I goal, a Title IV goal, or rather, not goal, but investment. I'm going to go into my data inventory. I'm going to make it really clear what that new data is. And then I'm going to go ahead and write that investment. And there won't be any hitches along the way of approval. Yeah. Let me ask kind of a related, since we're talking right now on the data inventory, and that's something that we've received a handful of questions in at the agency since we brought this forward. Um, just uh, put you on the spot a little bit to kind of uh, whoever around the table who would like to take this um, to talk a little bit about the rationale for the data inventory as opposed to putting everything in the CIP as we've uh, as we've done previously. Some of the concerns are this is a new ask and in some ways it is, but I think it's also a reduction of work uh, on the other hand. And I don't know who wants to, to chime in here first to help clarify that. Sure, I'll start. Um, <clears throat> so this is Jesse, so I'm going to speak to kind of the CFP side of it. So um, there's kind of a, a couple needs. We we saw, you know, on my team's end that oftentimes the continuous improvement plan sort of looked one of two ways through our lens. Either folks had attempted to sort of stuff as much as they could into the continuous improvement plan in the hopes of supporting all of their federal investments, or there wasn't enough in the continuous improvement plan to support all their federal investments. And, and we were finding that the, the, the former was sort of running afoul of, I think, what the intention of the continuous improvement planning process was. And, and Josh, I'll, I'll let you jump in and speak to this. Sure. Um, on our end, we, we need that data. And I think rather than forcing folks to kind of squeeze it all into their continuous improvement plan, we created the data inventory as sort of a pre-step to continuous improvement planning, as well as to applying for CFP funds that will allow you to really present data across the range of domains and across the funding sources in support of your CFP application, freeing up the continuous, continuous improvement planning process to be something more aligned with what it was intended to be by Josh's team. And, and I'll let Josh speak to that a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Um, exactly. And to your point, what we were seeing was um, a, a lot of 
everything but the kitchen sink kind of being put into uh, continuous improvement plans as far as um, goals and specifically uh, change ideas. Uh, when really the the purpose and intent of continuous improvement is to prioritize one or two, uh, two to three goals um, that you would like to work on uh, and, and focus on that and, and have that continuous improvement plan be a working living document um, and not just a document that drives um, perhaps all of your investments. And you, Josh, you said one of the things that you've seen in the past, you've seen people in order to meet the requirements of uh, federal programs that they've had. 25 sub goals written into their CIP, not because those were their 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 really their their core needs, correct? But because they needed to do it in order to justify the the investments that they wanted to to make. Yeah, good point. So so yes, uh, I, I looked back recently and with one SU, um, exactly, they had 30 some odd um, bulleted changes ideas listed under under each goal, um, and all of their plans across all we'll say six schools across the rest of you were exactly the same. Um, so they were asking again, how do we make school specific CIPs? And I said, well, here's a good example of, you've done all the work to identify um, your needs across the SU and the schools. Um, what you can do is go back through these chain list of 30, 35 change ideas and have each school have their leadership teams identify the two or three uh, change ideas that they want to prioritize. And that way they become more school specific with schools implementing based on their need and not just based on, you know, a group of, of 30 to 35 change ideas. I want to draw people's attention. Uh, hopefully you can see this on the screen right now that there is uh, a sample, a couple pages actually, and there are more than that exist on the, the website um, of Jesse and his team have put together a sample of what um, a, a pretend <clears throat> data inventory might look like. This is particular under the domain of safe and healthy schools, the sources used, and kind of the level of explanation that, that, uh, that's needed there. Um, you know, it, not that it needs to be exactly this, but just to give some, some an exemplar, some, some guidance to folks. Likewise, uh, his team wanted to show off the, that there are some requirements to under title that things that absolutely need to be there if you want to use title. Um, title funds for this, but hopefully what, what's clear from this is this particular example under Title IV considerations is almost verbatim from the Safe and Healthy Schools with a couple of things, those bullets down in red that have been added. So while it looks like pages and pages, a lot of it is uh, potentially cut and paste. Um, this is available um, for you to, to take a look at. It lives on our website right now under the Com Continuous Improvement tab, Data Inventory. I think it's a CFP, CIP data inventory or something like that. We have a link to this that we can share out. Um, and it's at, at the very bottom of the data inventory. We have three or four pages of built in of some of what some sample data might, might look like. And Patrick, if I can just carry the example yeah. one more step. So if, if you can leave it right here. Okay. So in looking at this example, this is the data that was provided to support the promoting safe and healthy students intent of Title IV. Now you'll see the second bullet from the bottom Professional Development Survey identifies classroom management strategies as the primary PD need of new staff. Now, this data would support an investment in your CFP application to maybe send teachers to PD around classroom management. It does not necessarily mean this is going to be one of your goals in your continuous improvement plan. So I think maybe that illustrates from the CFP side the purpose of this. This data in inventory allows you to share additional information, and it needs to be needs-based, to support your CFP application that may not, quote unquote, make the cut for your continuous improvement plan. This may not be a priority initiative in your building or in your LEA. It may be something you recognize as a need for your CFP fund spending. And so this is the place where you kind of cover all your bases and it leaves the CIP free to be more of that focused two or three goals. Right, and I think, uh, thanks for that, Jesse. And I think another thing is that the goals that you pick for your continuous improvement plan don't have to be areas that your data are saying you're doing poorly in. So let me use an example for this, made up example, but that uh, for the last three years, let's say you've invested heavily in, uh, in math instruction in your, uh, in your school, in your district, whatever it might be. And when you do your data inventory, what you find is across the board, all student groups, you've had increase in performance. You say, you know what? We are going to continue this as a goal, or maybe where it's not gonna be a CIP goal, but we're gonna continue this as an investment now we're only going to limit it to this, this professional development that, we've, uh, that our teachers have gone through 
to all new hires in the district, but we still want them to be able to, um, to participate in this. We see it as value. Um, even though our data doesn't say this is a, you know, quote unquote problem, um, but it's actually saying the opposite, that, that because of this investment that we've had in the past, we're seeing success, we're noticing that, and we're going to continue to either make it a goal or at least make it an investment. Um, and we just want to, to, to draw that change there, mm -hmm. that distinction there. All right. Um, I haven't seen any questions pop up at this point. Um, or anything on the chat. We have a couple others that have been submitted in uh, in advance, so we'll go to those. Um, let's see here. An SU says that they've spent the last two years developing a five-year strategic plan with a bunch of folks from the community and school involved in the process. Do we need to continue to uh, do we need to conduct another needs assessment for the CIP mm -hmm. after all this work was done? Yeah, good question. Um, Yes, yeah, so uh, uh, comprehensive needs assessment should be conducted annually, uh, and it says right in 2125 continuous improvement plans within the education quality standards that you know these plans should also be reviewed annually for effectiveness towards meeting um, your stated goals, and shall be revised if necessary. Uh, and I'm assuming that data will be used annually to look at. The, the progress you're making within your continuous improvement plan or, or strategic plan and this is what you call it in this case. Um, so those data, that data can be added um, within the, the um, continuous improvement plan template when you submit your templates annually. So did you want to <clears throat> Yeah, and I'll, and I'll echo, echo that. You know, there are some requirements under, under federal statute, under ESSA, um, for comprehensive needs assessments um, to support several different titles, different, different needs assessments requirements, different planning requirements. Um, you know, I'm going to kind of echo what Josh said, um, you know, even outside of statute, that, that as you're engaged in strategic planning, you know, the five-year, three-year plan, whatever you have, undoubtedly you're collecting data and, and sort of the data that's informing what you're doing in any given, you know, year or even month is, is ever-evolving. And so I think, you know, oftentimes this will be a process of sort of revising and updating, you know, and, and hopefully not starting from square one. I think, you know, all of us, you know, with experience in schools know that these wheels turn slowly. These trends are long trends, um, you know, to sort of start whole hog, you know, from the very beginning each year doesn't make sense. And certainly not isn't something we would expect. You know, it probably wouldn't even make it sense for us to receive something that looked totally different from, from the previous year. But certainly to make some updates, you know, would be an expectation, yeah. both to support the continuous improvement planning process and to support your application. Yeah. Right. Um, another question. Um, and this is a little bit specific, but I think that we can get to uh, some kind of some broader questions from it. Uh, it says, what data are you looking for under global citizenship? So one of the things in the one of the, the rows that we have listed in the um, in the data inventory says global citizenship uh, under the academic proficiency those particular rows or are, 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 are foci came from the education quality standards those are the named curricular areas in the education quality standards um, but I'll throw that out to the table is like what do we mean by global yeah. citizenship or for other sorts of um, areas of focus that we that might be included there yeah so so I think um, for me, I, I, for this one, I, I dug into the education quality standards, and what we would want to see is any measures that provide data on, um, or assessment data on concepts of civics, economics, geography, or language, cultural studies, and history. Um, we do not have specific assessments that we're looking for. Um, a lot of times those are determined locally, um, but those are some of the ideas of what we'd be looking for as far as some of that global citizen citizenship sources of data, again, for um, continuous improvement plans, if you had a goal related to uh, global citizenship. Anything, Dad? No, I, I would echo that. I would think, you know, if, if you've got a need sort of under that subcategory, then and you probably got some data, you know, and share that data. And, you know, this is what politicians call a bit of a turn. I'm going <laughs> to say that, you know, we, we are not looking to, to be super prescriptive about the data you provide. I, I got a question recently from a, a representative of an LEA asking me, you know, is it okay if I use this data or is this data too old or is this the data you want? And my response, you know, basically was that's, that's a local decision. You know, if, if you are providing what you feel adequately supports your continuous improvement planning goals and or your CFP application investments, 
you know, then you're golden. You know, we're going to be looking at that to see, you know, is there really a clear connection between what you've got for data and what you're seeking to do? But ultimately, you know, we're not going to give you a list of, you know, must-haves, must-not-haves and, and send it back to you, you know, with a big red mark on it, you know, if you've done one or the other. That's that's not what we're looking to do. You know, we understand that across the state there's a spectrum of the availability of data, of um, a culture of data use, um, and, and that we're all kind of learning this together. And so for the time being, you know, I, I think, and, and maybe folks around the table feel differently, give it your best shot. You know, make mm -hmm. your best effort to support those things you want to do and, and provide us with the data you've got. Um, and, and we'll continue to kind of work on, on growing that together. Yep, and we echo that for uh, continuous improvement plans as well. Great. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to answer this next question that's been submitted, but I'll throw it out. Um, I think it's a it's a good one, and it also show a little bit of kind of behind the curtain conversations at the AOE. But uh, someone says I'm piloting the new MTSS self assessment tool. Can I submit that for our needs assessment? Um, I, I'll take a first stab at answering this, um, and, and I'll kind of do a pivot along the talk, <laughs> learning from uh, from, from my, my colleague Jesse here. Um, so, first of all, you should know that that, um, that these are conversations that we're actually continuing to have, and we're really working to make sure that anything that's being developed within the agency is not being duplicative. We're not always going to be 100% successful in that, but we're having these conversations so that if there is something that's being asked of, of districts to be done um, that we're hopefully you'll be able to pull the data from whatever that other form is and stick it into what, you know whatever this other ask is. There may be some cutting and pasting that goes along with that, but we're really trying to, to, to minimize that. That being said, we are having conversations. Uh, we have a, a conversation set up with the, uh, the MTSS team as they're about ready to roll out. I know this is specific to the pilot. Uh, but they're uh, they're moving toward rolling out of uh, a self-assessment tool. Um, we in, in, to, to have this exact conversation. Um, this was something we talked about previously, but the MTSS team said, you know, this is not going to be ready for everyone to be using in advance of when the field is going to need it in order to put in their CIP and CFP applications. So we kind of kick that down the road uh, to next year because folks will be doing this uh, this in advance knowing that we have someone from our team here on the on the fourth floor that, who's a part of that conversation on the design of the self-assessment tool on the fifth floor who can represent those uh, going forward. Um, <clears throat> that being said, I'll kind of throw out the question that I avoided for someone else to try to answer. If they're actually piloting the self-assessment tool, is that something that can be used in lieu of uh, the data inventory? Or I'll open a little broader. Some uh, supervisory unions have said, we've already developed our own version of a data inventory. Is that something that we can uh, that we can be using? Yeah, so this is Jesse. I'll, I'll take a shot at that. You know, I think where we landed in conversations internally was that if you've got a data inventory, um, you know, that you feel is, is comprehensive, that you feel covers what you're planning to do in your continuous improvement plan in terms of goals, or that represents the spending you want to do under the intents of the titles in your CFP application, you know, we're not looking to force you to reinvent the wheel. Right. So it may mean uploading that tool. Right. It may mean cutting and pasting from that tool into the tool we provided or a different tool. It, it may be means submitting, you know, the, the MTSS SAT tool. Um, I think, well, I said before, we're not planning to send the data inventory back. We're not planning to wag fingers to put red marks on them. Where the rubber sort of heats, meets the road is, you're going to ultimately get feedback on whether or not what you've submitted supports your continuous improvement plan goals. You're going to get some responses from the CFP team around, hey, we do or don't feel like this adequately supports this investment. So while we're not necessarily going to prescribe the template, the form, the content, the measures used, really the test is going to be, does it support the things you want to do either in your continuous improvement plan or in your CFP application? So if you feel that the tool you've got on hand, um, the MTSS SAT tool, you know, when that ends up being rolled out, if you feel that adequately covers the things you're looking to do, you know, go ahead. We may provide you with some feedback saying you need more or you need different. But, you know, where the rubber meets the road is really going to be when we start processing those plans, when we start processing those applications, not so much a check on what you've submitted, you know, in advance of those things. Yeah. Um, again, echoing same for, for continuous improvement. Um, and I know in a few cases, we've had folks reach out to their education quality coordinator um, 
with some other kind of data inventories that they're using uh, for some other work to see if those would be accepted. So please, um, if you do have a question, you can always, like Jesse said, feel free to submit if you're fairly confident that it covers those those needs. Um, and if not, feel free to reach out to your education quality coordinator who can kind of look at that uh, before you submit. I want to draw attention to a comment that uh, Evangeline, uh, one of our uh, national partners from the Ed Development Center made that she said that she wants everyone to remember that data does not have to be quantitative, mm -hmm. that it is qualitative. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that's something that we've outlined in some of these samples, talking about walkthrough data, observations, uh, but that making sure that they're factual and objective, that, that we really, that we, we encourage that. It's not just, we don't just want SBAC percentages uh, and scores. Like we want something that's that's really, not that those aren't important, but we don't want to limit data to, you know, to the strict quantitative uh, data sources. Uh, um, another question that's come through, uh, our district has completed a five-year strategic plan, portrait of a graduate that included a year of meetings with the community and other stakeholders. Goals have been identified with meaningful outcomes. Oh, there it is. oh can this document be the basis for our CIP? That, that they've been doing as part of this uh, for the last the five year strategic plan, plan that identified meaningful outcomes. Can that document be the basis of the, the CIP? And I think I'm going to pivot a little bit to um, to kind of showing. Um, let's see here. Um, the one pagers that we kind of directed you guys to, to focus on in advance of today. Um, these are just simple cut and paste with a big caveat that these are drafts, not for uh, for broader sharing, that we're kind of, again, uh, a little behind the curtain of our development. Um, we will be coming forward with uh, more high quality graphic design. Um, this outlines a process to go through a comprehensive needs mm -hmm. assessment. It is not the process, it is a process uh, to go through a comprehensive needs assessment. It's a good process, um, but, Two people who have spent their life studying this process are going to do it in, in different sort of ways. So what I would ask, uh, would suggest in answering this question is fidelity to the intent of the process, not fidelity to exact step by step by step for how you're doing this. So um, if you've spent a bunch of time engaged in this strategic planning, you have done the things like involving the community um, that you've gone through, you know, you've You've looked at data. You've started to uh, to take some of these uh, these other steps, getting down to you know, identifying problems of practice, root cause analysis. Absolutely, don't throw that out and start again because you've been engaging in exactly this process. There may be additional steps that you'll need to take from what you've put together to actually complete a CIP. But don't start again and um, and ask people to give up another Wednesday night in the winter time to come out and you know and, and engage in that. Yeah. Josh, anything you wanted to add? Uh, just, just we, we've already seen that question a few times as well. Um, and someone, uh, someone said, someone asked, "Well, we've spent this time developing our case improvement plan. We have four goals, uh, but in the webinar you said we can only have three. Uh, again, like Patrick said, do not throw out this work. Um, we are going to allow you to have that that fourth goal. Um, of course, we would. Um, but like Patrick said, it's more about following these steps in the process." And not necessarily following um, a specific um, template that we have or anything. So, yes, that do not throw out that that five year strategic framework. But on, along the same lines, I'm assuming that you know it's a five year strategic plan. In five years, you're not going to look to see how how you did. You're going to want to look at that annually, um, probably more than annually, probably several times a year. Again, collecting that data, as Patrick said, for your, your comprehensive needs assessment to make any adjustments to that plan as needed. Uh, a follow-up to this, um, we've done this five-year strategic plan. Can we submit one CIP for the entire district? So, so what we're asking for, um, and this is in the newly released CIP review checklist, um, and also that schools have to have school-specific continuous improvement plans. So a lot of the plan may be the same, the goals and everything that goes down, but when it gets to the change ideas, we want to see change ideas that are specific to that school need um, because we know all schools are not the same. But yes, schools can definitely share the same goals. You can be achieving the same 
vision. As a matter of fact, you may have you may have two goals that you want all the schools in the SU based on your comprehensive needs assessment to achieve, but then maybe you have a school school C say that says, well, we also identified this as a need, so they would go ahead and put that third goal in there, um, which again would make theirs more school school specific. But yes, you can have it right down to the change ideas, but when it comes to the change ideas, um, some may be similar, but we also want to see how those change ideas um, meet the specific needs of those schools. Well, and that also reflects an understanding of the data, for example, that an individual school, that schools may be in different years of implementing a change, they may be, have had more success, or they may have a different student population. And so because of that, the specific change ideas that are going to be unique to the context of, of the school, even if the overall you know, SUSD goal is, is consistent. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see if we've had any additional questions that have come through. I don't see any that have come through uh, immediately or anything else in the chat. Um, I'm going to move forward to um, another related question. It's getting a little bit ahead of where we were uh, going to go, but um, sorry for going through all of this as we're watching me fast forward through a PowerPoint slide. I want to. So we've had some questions that have been related to the timeline, and I wanted to take. Uh, we wanted to take a few minutes to make sure that folks um, are clear on this to try to reduce some anxiety. Um, there are no. I don't want to say there are no deadlines. Um, the, the deadlines are not. There, there are there are opening dates more than there are deadlines for things that that need to be done. Um, for example, next week, uh, this week, well, I guess it's actually probably, we say the 15th of February, it's probably going to be on, you know, is it open on Saturday? Maybe I'll set it for that. But uh, it, it may not be until next Monday or Tuesday that, that it officially opens. But the CIP application window is, is opening, you know, this week, early next week. Um, that means that you can submit your CIP application. It does not mean that you have to submit your CIP application at that point but that it means that it is now open for you to, to, start, um, to start working in that sandbox. On the 1st of April, the CFP application window opens. Um, in order to submit, submit, not in order to have, uh, in, not in order to start working, but to in order to submit a CFP application, you have to have an approved CIP application. Some people have taken this to mean, oh my goodness, I have to have my CIP application in immediately so that I can submit my CFP application um, on the 1st of April. That is when the window opens. Um, you are not able to uh, begin to obligate funds for CFP until the 1st of, uh, of July. Mm -hmm. So really you have a three month window for that CFP application in order to, uh, in order to submit it. Um, I'm going to turn over to, to, to Jesse first because I, I think you've done a nice job of kind of clarifying this and helping us think about this internally, and, and hopefully you can share that wisdom here. Yeah, no, I think I think Patrick, you represented that well, and I'll just sort of rephrase it. There's there's really no benefit to having a submitted initial CFP application on let's say May 1st versus June 30th. You cannot be substantially approved. Um, for obligating CFP funds. You cannot have a substantially approved CFP application until the first day of the fiscal year, which is July 1. So I think, I think maybe in some of the messaging in the past, we, we created some maybe maybe undue and, and unintentionally created some undue anxiety <clears throat> where folks thought, exactly as Patrick just said, oh man, I need to have these SIPs approved, these CIPs approved by April 1 because that's when that application opens and I got to get that application in ASAP. Nope, the CFP application really isn't going to do you any good until July 1. So like I said before, submit it in May, submit it in April, submit it in mid-June. Either way, you're not substantially approved to begin obligating funds in your CFP application until July 1. So like Patrick said, that gives you several months to get your continuous improvement plans up to snuff and get those submitted and approved and get your CFP application written because, again, there's no benefit to having it in before that for your own peace of mind, for whatever your process is, it may come in earlier than that, that's great. But it really doesn't matter until the first day of the fiscal year. Um, I think Josh, it's also, yeah, I was gonna say, Josh, can I ask you a related question on this in that um, I think some people <clears throat> also misunderstood the idea of uh, an approved CIP needed in order to submit a CFP 
CFP as opposed to begin working on a CFP. Yeah, so I had a, I had a few concerns, concerned uh, folks in the field uh, who thought they could not even access the, the CFP application until their CIPs were approved, and that's not the case. So on April 1st, they will have access and, and can begin working on their CFP application, even though they, their CIPs have not been submitted yet. Yep, there was a, so, and it's, a, it's an understandable concern. So there used to be yeah. sort of a, a technological block that existed in the grants management system that actually prevented folks from even opening and working on their CFP applications until all their CIPs had been approved. That was, that was cut last year, sort of that tie between the two processes in order to make that timeline a little less um, anxiety inducing. You know, we saw that there was no reason folks shouldn't be able to work in their CFP applications while at the same time working on their CIPs. And really the break is that you can't have your CFP application submitted and approved until those SIPs are approved. You know, the, the SIPs should in part drive you know, in some ways, some of your CFP spending, they may or may not, and the data inventory is meant to alleviate that a bit. But in the past, it was definitely true that you needed to have approved CIPs to begin work in your CFP application. That's no longer the case. You can work in them simultaneously. So on April 1, when that CFP application window opens, even if all your SIPs haven't been approved, you can begin drafting your CFP application. Um, I want to just go back to, partially because I spent a lot of time, uh, not a lot of time, but I, I like the, the slide that we put together here uh, that we were talking about. Uh, and, and this is getting back to the, you know, to the data inventory and how the data inventory in some ways serves two different masters. It is, um, you know, it's the first step you're going to need to take in order to be able to do your continuous improvement plan. You're going to have to have a data inventory. That same data inventory will then also serve your, your continuous, uh, I'm sorry, your, your, uh, your federal programs application as well. Um, and, but it's the, kind of the first step of both of those, uh, and just want to make sure that, that that's clear. So even though if, if you're looking for something to do later on this week, starting on the data inventory is not a bad idea. While we're doing that, uh, mentioning this data inventory, I want to, um, uh, to highlight um, an opportunity if anyone is interested in this. We were going to, the data inventory that we've shared out with the field is simply a Word document. We played with the idea, well, actually more than played with the idea, we built this idea, uh, this data inventory in a second, um, uh, uh, um, a second uh, location um, through the, a program called Cognito, which is effectively a fillable PDF. It's not exactly that, but it's a fillable form that you can do. Um, we ultimately decided not to run that out to the field just to, we were sensing the, the, the stress from the field and didn't want to throw one more thing on there. The Cognito form is alive, and if there's anyone who would like to use that next year, first of all, next year we're most likely going to be moving to that Cognito form. Um, it, is it is really intended to be a simplified way to do it. It should be easier than working in Word for this. We're not positive. If you're interested in trying to uh, be one of the, the, the guinea pigs for the, the Cognito form, please get in touch with us. We have it. You're absolutely welcome to use it in that form as opposed to Word, uh, but we've ultimately not um, uh, kind of shared it out with the field, but, but let us know. All right, we have another question that's come up. Um, Let's see. It says, it's more, I'm just going to read, it's more than just the first step in doing the CFP. Doesn't the data inventory allow for things that you want to fund, like academic support teachers, that aren't front burner issues that go on the CIP? Yep, and that's exactly right. And, and thank you for kind of making that point again. I think it's an important one. Yeah, the data inventory gives you a new space to, to provide justification for you know, everything that you intend to spend on in your CFP application, even if it isn't a front burner continuous improvement plan type of need. Um, so again, rather than trying to fit everything into the continuous improvement plan, everything under the sun that you want to invest in in your CFP application, the data inventory creates a new space for you to make those cases, leaving the continuous improvement plan as a place where you focus on two or three most needed, most important goals. Um, we focus quite a bit on, on getting a little bit into the, I don't want to say into the weeds, but we're really trying to respond to the questions that the field has had on this. Um, 
we structured this really though to kind of talk about largely the 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 uh, the CNA process, the um, comprehensive needs assessment process. Um, and I was, if you have questions specifically about um, individual steps in that process, we would certainly entertain those. Um, I don't know if uh, Josh or uh, Kevin or Mariana um, have anything that they would like to, some words of wisdom around either developing a shared vision or the, the development of uh, the data inventory, not the specific tool, but uh, more conceptually that, uh, that you would like to, to share right now. And, you don't have to, but I just want to make that an opportunity if there's something that is really burning that you that you think is important from um, from your experience working with the schools. Um, well, I'll talk about two questions that have come in in regards to the shared vision. Uh, specifically, uh, they came in due to what's on our CIP review checklist um, and some work that I'm actually going to be doing with a, a, a supervisory union here recently. Um, but, but the question was, can can all schools in the SU, can they have the same shared vision? Um, and the answer is yes, they can. We just want you to provide that information in your shared vision thing and kind of your reasoning for um, all of your schools within your SU having that same shared vision. That, that's certainly acceptable. And then the second one, the second one was around uh, that we're asking if you have not that to develop your shared vision, you at least have to have a process in which you review and potentially revise that shared vision annually. So just a brief description on what that may be. It may be, you know, all of our schools bring their shared vision to their school board for review annually. Whatever that process is that you use, maybe it's the SU leadership team that takes a look at that annually. Um, but if that's the case, then, and, and you look at that annually just to review, and potentially revise, then we just want to see a brief brief narrative um, about what that process is for, for you within your, your SU or SD. If I can add something to this, this is Kevin. Um, I, I, I agree with what I've heard here. It's been better, better articulated than I would have done even myself, but we've gotten some calls and a couple of emails. And what we're trying to say, I think, underscores a lot of what you've heard from Patrick and Josh and Jesse. This is not a whole scale change in the kind of work that we as coordinators and, and the people in EQA have been asking for in the continuous improvement plan process. It's still data-based. We've been talking about this uh, since I've been here, and it's still focused with, a, with, a, with an impetus on your own collective thinking at your SUSD and for your school. So we, we're looking at these as tools that are going to allow you to do your job hopefully better than just as some, an add-on for an additional work thing. And so we're happy to take questions and, and, and to give you any kind of feedback we can uh, that helps make your job easier. We understand that um, anxiety can be high about a number of things, but I think the overall conversation, what I've heard here, underscores what we've been trying to say, at least to the best that we can from our role, that this is a tool that's gonna help you, it's gonna organize your data a lot better. And when we have questions about your continuous improvement plans, it's gonna be a lot easier to have those discussions based on this framework than it was in the past when it was much more quasi and opened and, and there were these other anxiety links between the CFP that's already been discussed. I want um, to take a step uh, forward here and kind of start to dip our toe into, uh, into what we'll be talking about in, se in session two, but that's kind of moving from the data inventory to choosing a broad area of focus. Uh, Josh and I have been having an ongoing conversation for the last uh, couple of days about what's the difference between analyzing the data and choosing a broad area of focus. And I think that the answer is ultimately it doesn't really matter, um, that it's, it's a continuum, it's a, it's a spectrum, and where the data inventory and that analysis and choosing a broad area of focus where one starts and the other begins is not so important as saying, here are the data. This is what we're seeing from them. These are kind of the big things that we want to uh, to take through that sieve to, to narrow it down a little bit further to start to go through the next steps in that um, uh, the CNA process. Um, I don't know, Josh, you want to rebut my take on, on where I thought we might have landed in our in our No, I, I think that's great. The, the choosing your broad areas of focus is really to provide that initial direction uh, for your deeper data analysis. Like you said, driving it through that so perfect. All right, I want to I want to go backward just a, a little bit to a question that came up or a, a point that was made. Um, and Mariana was 
um, was pointing out to us that on the question of the specifically around the, the data inventory and the, the question of whether this has to be done, a, a CNA um, continuous needs uh, um, uh, assessment needs to be done annually or not. She wanted to really bring up the point of schools who are eligible for equity supports um, that part of your work is that, yes, you really do need to do a thorough look at your um, your continuous improvement plan and in turn your your CNA uh, annually. You've been you know that there, there is some sort of uh, substantive and, and persistent distance uh, uh, difference in the performance of your historically marginalized and historically privileged students. And we want that to be reflected in at least one goal in your continuous improvement plan. In order to do that, you'd need to look at, you know, what to do a comprehensive needs assessment. It's very possible that a school has been engaged in this, that they already have, have created a goal in the past that's addressed this. But we want to see, yes, we actually have thought about this. We understand this. And, um, and one of our goals is pointed directly to that. Um, Mariana, do you want to add anything further to that? No, I think that's great. Thanks. Yeah. Kevin or Josh? Before we move toward closing, I was going to see if there are any more uh, questions that popped up. I also wanted to give um, Evangeline and David if they uh, had anything that they wanted to uh, to add to the conversation. I don't see any more questions or comments at this point. Don't see any hands raised. Um, but uh, Evangeline and David, if you wanted to add anything, please um, please do so. Hi, Patrick. This is Evangeline. Um, I don't think I have anything to add at the moment. I think uh, you guys have covered all the key points and um, I I would I look forward to the next sessions because I think some of what you talked about, um, like I think progress monitoring, selecting a change idea, those will be uh, things that will uh, where we could get into some of those details. Um, but at this point, Sounds good to me. Um, I know David is in a noisy area, so I'm not sure uh, if he has anything to say, but if he does, he probably will add it to the chat. Great. Um, yep. Uh, thank you, Evangeline. I also wanted to, to point out that the slides and the um, uh, some of the, the, the resources that David and Evangeline and, and, and their partners um, made for the, uh, the canceled event that we had back in November we have shared that out with all the folks who had registered for the event. If you didn't have it, if you can't find it, if you weren't signed up for it, please let us know, and we are um, we'd be happy to share that back with uh, with folks. And there's some really nice resources to help you go through, particularly kind of the next couple sessions. Um, real quickly, before we uh, before we sign off, we did get one additional question: Should we be naming that we are in equity status? Uh, on the data inventory or CIP that you're eligible for equity supports. Um, I, um, Josh, I, we certainly have that information, but is, I don't know if there's a spot that's specific. Go ahead, Mariana. Um, you do have to have a, hi, this is Mariana. Um, you do have to have a goal that satisfies um, whether you are a school eligible for comprehensive supports or a school eligible for equity support. So, you do have to have a goal around that um, or a strategy, um, but that's really all I think, if, unless anyone else wants to add, but. There's not a box to check on the CIP that no. says um, uh, we are a school who's eligible for that. You know, all of the coordinators know who their schools are who are eligible and we'll be kind of looking for that to make sure that those are reflected. Yes, we have that one. Yeah. Oh. Um, Great. Um, and so our next steps, uh, we are going to be hosting another one of these, um, looking at kind of the, the middle part of the comprehensive needs assessment process, uh, discussing problems of practice. We're going to be reconvening in the same way on the 4th of March. Um, and then on the 11th of March, we'll have our final one looking at planning and testing change ideas. Um, so, so circle those. If you have not registered for those, um, in last week's weekly field memo, there was uh, a link to those that you can do. It'll also be, it was not in the field, weekly field memo that went out today. 
we are going to repost that for session two and three for the weekly field memo for next week. Um, but go ahead and, uh, and circle those dates. Additionally, that this is uh, being recorded and we are working on transcribe. We will be working on transcribing it and getting this up for people who are not able to attend. And we will um, get out information certainly to the registry, regis, registries, registry. registrants, thank you. Um, and that, that it's up for your review. And we also, you know, this is not, it's going to be on our website. This isn't something super secret that, you know, that you have to have a, a password to get in and, um, and see. We encourage you to, uh, to take, uh, to share this around with, uh, with your colleagues. Um, um, also, these, uh, all of these slides are going to be available. It has links to the data inventory, to the comprehensive needs, assess, uh, comprehensive uh, needs toolkit. And um, we are also have a conversation that a lot of these questions that, that have been surfaced, we're going to build into an FAQ. And over the course of the next couple weeks, uh, we are going to uh, start to put that FAQ that will just kind of be a growing document um, that um, that will live on the website as well. Josh, you yeah, want um, to add something? I would like to go back to, to uh, Paul's question just to clarify something. Um, it, it's correct that you do not have to identify whether you are uh, eligible for comprehensive or equity supports on your data inventory or on your CIP template that you will be uploading. But when you go into GMS to upload your data inventory and to upload your CIP template, um, under the Assurances tab, that is where you will click if you are eligible for a comprehensive support or, or, or equity support, as well as that you're adhering to uh, Title I school-wide program requirements similar to last year. It, it, it looks that, that, that tab when you go in to submit your CIP looks the same as last year. So that is where you would identify if you are eligible for comprehensive or, or, or equity support. Excellent, thank you. Thanks and if you do not know, please contact your education quality coordinator because we have those lists available to you. Sure. Jesse, any last words of wisdom? Nope, thanks so much for your hard work, guys. Um, okay. I know, you know, every time something new comes down the pipe, you know, it just represents another thing on your plates that are already very full. Um, you know, hopefully in the end, this ends up alleviating um, you know what some of the asks are or, or were in the past, um, but, but please know we're always very, very appreciative of all the good work you do, and, and we appreciate your, your colleagueship and your support. Yeah, and I will certainly second that. It's, uh, it's, it's tough work, and please know that any, uh, in, this is the first year that we've, uh, that we've moved in this direction. Please know that any changes that we've made were really intended to make things more streamlined. If they are not, we need to know that so that we can uh, so that we can you know, make adjustments, um, and also know that we're very uh, that we're very very flexible in you know in having conversations. If you, if you have a question, please just reach out to us for, for anything further. Um, and uh, with that, I'll say uh, thanks to Mariana, Kevin, Jesse, Josh, and Amy, um, and we look forward to seeing you uh, at the next one of these uh, in two weeks. Two weeks, March 4th. Thank Three you. Weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.